Hello YouTube friends, Chrissy here at A Little Glam, A Lot of Mom. Today I'm finally sharing about our entomology study. So we began collecting nature items years ago, but now further in our journey of being aspiring naturalists, we decided earlier this year that we would start a specimen collection. Now that merged into this ongoing study on entomology that started in spring um, and ongoing because when we choose homeschooling, of course, we choose a non-traditional way of learning and so we get the chance to expand our knowledge in no measured amount of time. This curiosity really just happened naturally and it unfolded from field observation, just being out in nature. Everyone takes part of this knowledge in one form or another, but there are certain children who take more interests and wish to pursue more knowledge and explore more rabbit holes than the others. Our goals for this study is obviously a knowledge of insects, uh, history in the field of entomology, data and research collection, field discoveries, and scientific illustrations, but overall just to expose our children to the field of science. And so today I'm going to share the resources we're currently utilizing to study insects and the tools we have required for collecting and displaying specimen. This collection of resources of course will grow as this passion continues to unfold, but this is where we are currently. In becoming naturalists, we want to learn more about our pioneers in the field. The Girl Who Drew Butterflies, How Maria Marian's Art Changed Science by Joyce Sidman. This is a beautiful biography of one of the first naturalists to observe live insects di directly and record the metamorphosis. It features some of Maria's illustrations. My teen daughter and I were the two who mostly enjoyed this biography. For the young kids, I picked up The Bug Girl, Maria Marion's Scientific Vision by Sarah Glenn Marsh. This book is very informative and explains details of her life's work in a fresh and engaging way for young children. Evelyn, the adventurous entomologist, the true story of a world traveling bug hunter, Evelyn Chessman. She embarked on eight solo expeditions, collected over 70,000 insect specimens, and discovered new species. I just love these stories of women trailblazers in the field. Small Wonders, Jean Henri Fabre and His World of Insects by Matthew Clark Smith, a picture biography on the life of the French entomologist who refused to examine dead specimens and instead dedicated his life to observing their behavior in their natural habitats. The Bluest of Blues, Anna Atkins, and the First Book of Photographs by Fiona Robinson, a biography not on an entomologist, but of a botanist and photographer. She published the first ever book of photographs in this biography, Science and Art Meet, and it's a true inspiration to the element of scientific illustration in our study. We also have an inspiring botanist and artist in our family, My Teen Girl, although this is a picture book, she adores it. and Beatrix Potter Scientist by Lindsay Metcalf. This picture book biography shows an unfamiliar aspect of the accomplished life of Beatrix Potter. Again, merging the essence of science and art, this book inspires us to observe, study, wonder, and draw. This next set of books are stories about insects or featuring insect protagonists. This is important to get kids to be delighted by insects, bringing clarity to their roles and debunking myths about insects. So I've pulled a few off of our shelves here to give some examples. Fireflies by Julie Brinklow. My early readers all have loved the stories of Grasshopper on the Road by Arnold LaBelle. I've shared about this one a lot in my recent videos as we study bees. In this peek -a through book, we follow a little bee through her day and we learn all about her contributions to nature.
Swirl by Swirl, Spirals in Nature by Joyce Sidman is another favorite, not just about insects, but it has enlightened us in the beautiful intricacies found in many insects. Because of this book, the kids are continually searching for patterns in nature. I will always recommend all of Nat Geo Kids nonfiction books. They're all wonderful. A current favorite as we study bees is this Nat Geo Kids reader. It's engaging, filled with so much information and captivating photography. We love illustrative nonfiction books. Again, bringing in the essence of science and art. Of course, Julia Rothman's Nature Anatomy is a wonderful reference style book with many introductory points to build upon and inspirational art. Another series we love is the illustrative series Nature Books. We wish to add more titles to our collection of this series. This book is basically a celebration of a variety of butterflies. We learn their host plants, life cycles, and more. Another title in this category that got lost in my piles here were Butterflies Grow by Puffin Books. Again, similar information on the life cycle of butterflies, but this title also offers suggestions on how children can grow butterflies in their own gardens. I think that books about activism and conservation are super important. The natural world is in danger, and so it's now more critical than ever to teach and inspire these environmental lessons. Our current favorite books that gently teach this topic are this series by Deborah Hopkinson. This title is Butterflies Belong Here. I just love the message this inspires to children about young people stepping up to take action and make a change for a better planet. Activity books are a must resources for my younger ones. We're currently loving and just about finished with this turn this book into a beehive. The experiments are super simplistic in a good way. This book is fun and effective. Sticker books are always a good idea for the youngest learners as well. We prefer and always recommend the Nat Geo sticker activity books, but this one is just one I had on hand already. Super engaging for teaching easy concepts like identifying insects and basic characteristics. Alright, so all of these books I've shared up to this point are optional. Now let's get into musts, field guides, and we have several here. The most fun field guides are the Fandix field guides without a doubt, fun silhouette cutouts, a lot of information, and field facts. These, however, are more for indoors and not so practical for the field. Pocket Genius by DK, small pocket books that are more practical for taking outdoors. The photography pops and this little book is packed with a good amount of information. Again, with another Nat Geo resource, this is Backyard Guide to Insects and Spiders of North America. This guide features the top 150 insects and spiders and it provides more text and information than a traditional field guide. It combines readable text, explanatory illustrations to highlight key features of anatomy, characteristics, and behavior, and of course the classic Nat Geo photography. Our favorite field guide is by the National Audubon Society. This one is clearly for butterflies. This is just organized and categorized so well, and so when it comes to referencing and identifying, this is the first one we grab because it's just so comprehensive and easy to use. It's also so efficient when categorizing types and families for displays. The photographs are visually arranged by color and silhouettes, and then there are these thumb tabs for quick and easy identification. Each species account also provides a lot of info like measurements, life cycle, characteristic, and more. We are definitely working towards adding more of these Audubon guides to our collection. I always recommend field guides or reference books specific to your region or even better to the state you reside in. We were super lucky to find this Florida Fabulous Butterflies resource which also features moths at a thrift store for a few cents. We're all just captivated by these stunning photographs and it's just important to uh, have that relation between the books that you're studying and the environment around you. A journal or logbook is also necessary, however, it doesn't have to be specific for insects. 
the prompts are helpful, but you can definitely keep a log in a blank notebook as well. So we like to combine our books, our field guides, and field observations with nature studies. We enjoy the nature lessons by Firefly Nature School. I shared us diving into that pollination lesson in my last day in the life video. We also love the nature studies by Hearth Magic. I love the gentleness and how Amber captures the whole child approach. Her nature studies include anatomy worksheets, coloring pages, handwork, suggestions, field work, and recipes. We've also been jumping in and out of the lessons of this arthropods unit study by The Good and the Beautiful. I love how these science studies are all Christ-centered as the creator of the natural world. We enjoy the vocabulary words and the worksheets because we can build a journal upon that and have something tangible for portfolio or record keeping. These lessons are also easy to modify for a wide range of ages or skill levels and even offer extension suggestions for older grades. This is also something I appreciate about the Firefly Nature School lessons. We're also sure to utilize the environment as a curriculum, and I'm not just talking about nature. We use everything our location and community have to offer. My daughter, for example, just attended an environmental summit at our local zoo and took a few sessions on beekeeping, community garden, nonprofit organization, conservation programs, and of course, for your older teenagers, there's also dual enrollment classes at your local college. My daughter will be taking a course on entomology. So let's jump into some of the tools and supplies we utilize often in our study of insects and observation of our specimens. We have a new digital microscope. We also have a binocular mi microscope. However, the light stopped functioning. I am going to attempt to repair it. But meanwhile, we've been enjoying this new one. Uh, this digital microscope is from Amazon. It came with an SD card for snapping photos and recording videos, a CD program for installing the software on a computer to have it displayed on a bigger screen so far so good so over time we've collected some supplies mostly from slide preparation kits uh, so for example when we lose pieces or fragments from our specimens like antennas and legs we can uh, prepare slides out of them and so that's been pretty neat uh, we also have these already prepared slides by learning resources these are lots of fun to pair with binocular microscopes we love this little pocket microscope for on the go. We've had this for several years and it still functions perfectly. I have not had any need to replace the battery. It's small but mighty. I keep a plastic container or Tupperware like this in my car to store the specimens we find. By the time we find our specimens, they are stiff and really fragile since they've been deceased. We found it best to use a larger hard container to protect it as much as possible. This is a butterfly mounting board, but it works really well for most types of insects. It's necessary. This board allows us to fit the head, thorax, and abdomen in the middle slot and spread the wings to dry. You'll see the process here shortly. Entomology forceps are best because they're made of a super light, flexible, and bendable stainless steel, which is ideal for handling fragile, tiny body fragments of insects. This is a pinning block used for the spacing of labeling in a specific labeling style or method. I'll explain the, la the labeling methods more in a minute. You always need a good stock of entomology pins in various width sizes. No, you cannot use thumbtacks. Wax paper, this is a regular cooking or baking paper. We use these in strips to pin wings and we also make little envelopes out of them to store specimens until we are ready to pin them. There is a specific entomology paper for this, but it's pricey and wax paper or parchment paper works perfectly fine. So it's ideal to store your specimens in this paper to avoid breaking, discoloration, or light bleaching, and to keep them from going even more stale as it would be exposed to dry air for a long period of time if you're not pinning your specimens right away. There are some specimens we find that are so stiff that we cannot fit them into the paper envelope, so I keep them in a basket with a lid. And then you'll notice that we also have duplicates and so those we also keep in these envelopes and those are used for observation under the microscope and exploration for the kids. 
In this basket, you'll see that I have a butterfly specimen that is just so damaged that will probably just use for use under the microscope. And then we have a blue dasher dragonfly uh, that a piece of the end broke off. So we have saved the tip and we will attempt to reattach it with glue. If that does not work, however, we will still keep the end piece and use it to prepare a microscope slide. I want to be clear that we do not collect live insects or specimens, so you won't find any of the supplies or see the process of euthanizing specimens here in this video. It is harder to come by deceased specimens, which means our collection is slow growing, and it also means that most of our specimens are not intact or in a perfect form. So those are the cons to not collecting live insects, but we do stand firm in those morals. All right, so I'm going to explain this pinning process as best as I can along with some footage of Ailani pinning two butterflies. So first we need to rehydrate the specimen. We use hot steaming water. Some insects will just need the steam, whereas the more delicate specimens like butterflies will need to gently soak in the steaming water. We will repeat this until the wings open without much force. One pin goes right through the thorax to stabilize the butterfly or insect, a few pins to position the antenna, and with this monarch we got lucky of it mostly being intact, tongue and all. So we only pierce the insect once in the thorax, and the rest of the pins are used around the specimen to manipulate the legs, antenna, etc. For the wings, we use paper strips to hold the desired position of the wing and pin through the paper strips, not the wing itself. We let it dry for about 48 hours.
The next step is identification and labeling. It's best to print labels and use good quality paper because eventually the ink can fade over time and we would lose our notes and research. This is why we also keep our log. You would of course annotate whatever you want on your labels. We choose to go with location it was found, so country, county, state, and specific location. For example, the Indian River Lagoon or a specific uh, state park. We choose to annotate the season and year instead of the exact date. The name of the person who collected the specimen. We mark deceased. The common name, a symbol for identifying whether it's a male or female, and below it the scientific name. The pinning block is used for the spacing of labeling in a specific labeling style or method mostly used in the professional labeling used in scientific research and labs. Also, people use this type of labeling in the slot type of display drawers. Our displays are up on the wall, so we choose to label underneath the specimen, not behind it, to be able to read the labels without bringing the display down from the wall. And finally, the process of transferring the specimens into a display case. Now, about display cases, wooden and glass entomology display cases are in the hundreds and up. We're always checking Facebook marketplace, thrift stores, but it's just not a common item. So we're utilizing shadow box display cases that you could find at a home decor store, Amazon, or even craft stores. I mentioned a few videos back that I ran into a sale at Michael's. It was buy one, get two, which made each case $10. The issue with shadow boxes meant for decor is that the backing will not be thick enough for entomology pins to pierce through. So we adapt by picking up extra foam boards, cut it down to size. It's a quick fix. To organize your specimens in display cases is a personal thing. I think the general idea is to keep them classified or grouped by genus. We pierce the pin through the backing of the shadow box uh, and then the same with the labels. So you could also use glue, but that would be more permanent. We want to be able to shift them around as our collection grows and we need to make room to group species or genus together. Again, this is a personal or family collection, so we're sure to just enjoy and learn from the process. All right, friends, so that's it for today's long-winded video. Again, I want to put out a disclaimer that we are not professionals in this field. This is a homeschool family project and a study and a hobby for my naturalist family. This is not the one right way to do it. This is not a tutorial. I am not claiming to be an expert. I hope that you can appreciate that I just share our ideas, experiences, and approach to our family learning in hopes that we can inspire other families to teach their children to love and appreciate our natural world because again, it's now critical more than ever that we make these connections with our children and the natural world for a better future.